Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I hope you guys are all doing good. I just want to invite you, just please close your eyes and just look at the Lord. Even before I came up here, I just started feeling his presence and his nearness. And I just, I just feel this fresh stirring of hunger in my heart. Jesus, we just welcome you here. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Lord, we don't wanna leave here the same. Jesus, we don't wanna leave here the same, God. I just pray that you would pour yourself out, Jesus. Make our hearts tender towards you. Make us sensitive towards you, Jesus. Lord, you're the one we've come here for. We are in love with you, Jesus. You are everything, Lord.
returning to the secret place with just an altar and a flame. Love is found here in our sacred space. I hear your voice, I see your face. You're still.
Yeah. 
confess that he is Lord. Lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven. Sing it. You are home. We're singing home. You are home. <laughs> oh, I feel something about to happen in this place. Something happens when you sing holy, holy, holy. Something happens when you magnify the name above all names. Oh.
is the kingdom of yours. Is the Is the kingdom yours? Is the power yours? Is the glory? Oh, yours is the kingdom yours? Is the power yours? Is the wasted because nothing is wasted in his presence so Lord we say yes come on church agree with me we say yes and amen Jesus we thank you Lord that you're restoring hope Jesus you're restoring joy you're restoring first love Jesus oh Jesus I thank you father for every heavy heart Lord I thank you that you're gonna give them joy everlasting Jesus your joy is our strength Jesus so I thank you God yeah, just even some of you are feeling like a tangible peace come over you right now. You're feeling light. You're feeling like this weight has just been lifted off of you. And we say yes in Jesus' name. Yes, in the name of Jesus, Lord. So restore the hope. Restore the joy, Lord. Let those that haven't laughed in years laugh again today, Jesus. Let those that haven't sang in years sing again, Jesus. Let those that haven't danced in years, let them dance before you again, Jesus. Restore the wonder, the childlike wonder in our hearts again, Jesus. We love you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give it up for our worship team. Love you. I think we have the best team in the world. I love them so much. And I swear I saw John doing the running man for a second. Anybody else? I'm gonna watch the playback of that, okay. All right, you guys can get seated and the worship team, you guys can go to your seats as well. It's offering time, it's offering time. We have a special guest, I have my dad here tonight. He's gonna be ministering the word to us. He's been here for a while, so he's like, I'm ready. And every time I would try to get up on the stage, I'm like, well, nope, John and Dom are still going, so I'm just gonna go stand right there but we have to give to Jesus because it's our joy to give, right? All right, if you guys will go to 1 Chronicles 21 through 22, or 21 verse 22. 
This was a, after David took the census and disobeyed God. You guys know the story. He wasn't supposed to do that, and he did that. And then it said, David said to Arana, let me buy this threshing floor from you at its full price. Then I will build an altar to the Lord there so that he will stop the plague. Remember, there was a plague that was sent because of the census that was taken. Take it, my lord, the king, and use it as you wish, Arana said to David. I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings and the threshing boards for wood to build a fire on the altar and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all to you. But listen to this part. But David replied to Arana, no, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. See, we have to give Jesus everything as we talked about this morning at church. That means all that we have, our time, our finances, our money. If you won't give Jesus your money, you're not gonna trust him with your life, right? So David was saying, I will not take what belongs to God that hasn't cost me something. What is also amazing to me is when I was reading through this last year, this place is the place where Solomon built the temple later on. So the place of sacrifice will become your place of praise. Oh, Amen, right? The place where you sacrifice will become your place of praise. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 3.1. So Solomon began to build the temple to the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David, his father. The temple was built on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, the site that David had selected. See, we don't know what the future holds, but God sees everything, right? So where we give our all to Jesus, he restores praise. He restores joy, like we were just saying. He restores hope. So tonight I just ask that if this is your church, of course you know your tithe belongs to the storehouse where you're fed. If this is not your local church, your tithe belongs to your local church. But I invite you to give offerings as well so we can bring the buckets here. If you need an envelope, just wave at me, raise your hand, and our ushers will bring some envelopes to you. You can text GIVE to the number on your screen if you're watching online and Jesus Image has blessed you. We love our online family, by the way. We want to also invite you to give as well. You can text GIVE to the number on your screen. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you. It's our joy, God, to give to you. It's our deepest honor to give all that we have to you, Jesus. So, Lord, we give you our very best, Lord. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. You are so worthy of everything we have. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We're going to run an offering song, and we'll be right back.
cannot wait till the choir is back. We're just about a month away from that. All of our students, you know, um, I will real quick say, if you're praying about coming to Jesus School, there is still time to come to Jesus School. We have students coming from all over the country right now, and I cannot, oh, they're amazing, our team. Thank you for that. And I just love our choir, and we miss them so much. So very soon. So if my dad is ready, so honored to have him. He is family to me, but he's a family to all of us here. You took too long. Huh? Thank you, thank you. Bless you, please. Thank you. Be seated, be seated. Thank you. Thank you. My first job is tonight, I have to go and kiss my wife. That's number one. Can you give her a big God bless? All right, thank you. Sue looks wonderful. Thank God. And are you people doing well? Well, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And listen, um, I just want to say just something. We've had so many of you sweet people write uh, text messages and all this stuff about Suzanne. She's doing good. Thank the Lord. And she's going to have a long life. Yeah. Amen. So tonight, I have a wonderful word from the Lord for you. And... I'm so glad to be with my beautiful daughter. Michael is flying back from Ohio. Okay. Can we all stand? We're going to just thank the Lord for his grace. Hallelujah. Hello, Bruce. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you're going to say to us tonight. And I'm asking you to do something very special. Enable your people to hear your word. You said in your precious word, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And your people tonight did not come to hear a man preach or teach. They came to hear your voice. They want your voice. They want to hear you speaking to their hearts. And so I ask, wonderful Father, oh, you are so wonderful. So wonderful. To you belongs the glory, blessed Holy Father. To you belongs the majesty, the praise, dominion, honor. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Holy Spirit. And so we pray in Jesus' name that you will speak to all of us in your holy name. Lift your hands and just pray in the Holy Ghost for just a few minutes, please. Come on. Just lift your voices and pray in the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come. Sweet Spirit, I pray. And come in your strength and your power. Oh, come in your own special way. Just 
just easy, softly. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, sweet Spirit, we pray. Come, in your strength and your power, Come in your own gentle way Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is peace Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is love there is comfort in life's darkest hour. There's light and life. There's health and power in the Spirit, in the Spirit of the Lord. Can we lift our hands and welcome the Holy Spirit here? Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Everyone now has a prayer to the Lord. We are asking now for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to descend upon us all. Let's welcome him, please. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in. Omnipotent Father, of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome. In this place, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in. Omnipotent, omnipotent. Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome. Feel all the hungry and thirsty within. Restore us, O oh Father. Revive once again Holy Spirit Thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit Thou art welcome in this place Omnipotent Father 
mercy and grace Thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome and grace Thou art welcome in this place Thou art welcome in this place Thou art welcome And he always comes when we glorify Jesus. We magnify Jesus. Jesus, there is something about your name. You are our master, our savior. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, there is something about that name, Master, Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain, sweet as Jesus, 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 let all heaven, let the earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms, they'll all pass away, but there's something about that name. Once again, glorify His name, Jesus, Lord Jesus, wonderful Jesus. There is something about your name, your master, sweet Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Let the earth proclaim Kings and kingdoms They'll all pass away But there's something about We give you the praise, the glory, the honor majesty and dominion amen 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 give the lord a mighty hand one more time amen thank you lord please be seated tonight i want your attention and i mean when i say your, your attention i mean all of it because because 
The message I have is not an easy one for some people to receive. But I want to ask you a question. How many of you want to finish well? You mean it? There's a prize. One more time. How many want to finish better? Wait, wait. <laughs> better than when you started. As a Christian, as a Christian. Okay. Now you do know that this life is a test. Right? This life is only a test for eternity. So this life really is somewhat important but not all important. It's important in that we have to make a decision in this life that will matter eternally. So this life is only a passing moment, a passing moment. Eternity is what really matters. All you have to do to wake up to reality is go to a cemetery. It'll show you life doesn't go on here, here on earth. People die every second, every minute. Millions, they say, die every day. Every day, millions die. So you can be gone tonight. It's possible, by the way, it's possible. I remember a young man in our church in OCC back years ago named Kevin Sweeney. And Kevin had a brother. And his brother <clears throat> was very uh, into the wild things of life. He enjoyed doing wild things. And he enjoyed riding his motorcycle, for example, at a high speed, at a high speed. So Kevin was, uh, at that time, I had just had a problem with my heart, what, what is called AFib, where the heart kind of beats abnormally. And the doctor said, listen, you need to go to a gym and kind of get your heart stronger. Okay, I said, fine. So they, they, they kind of put me on some medication that didn't do a whole lot for me. But he said, listen, what would really help your heart is if you go and walk on a treadmill but you have someone to watch you. They, they need to put stuff on whatever. They had to check my heart rate while I was on the treadmill. So I went to some place on Lee Road or somewhere down here where they, these people who knew medicine, it wasn't doctors, it was just these people who understood all this, and they would stick something in my chest and they would watch how my heart would work and when I was on this treadmill. And there was this young man there named Kevin who actually went to our church. And he kind of helped me to, you know, don't overdo it and now slow down and all that. His brother happened to be in church with him one Sunday night and, uh, and he got saved, gloriously saved. This wild guy, his brother got saved. So now on Tuesday, the following Tuesday, I happened to go to that place to work the treadmill and for them to watch how my heart does with it. And Kevin was just shattered. He was, just, he was so devastated. I said, what happened to you? He said, my brother died yesterday on Markham Woods. Markham Woods. He said he was going so fast on his, motor, uh, on, on his bike, he crashed into some tree or something and was killed instantly. And then with tears flooding, he said, but thank God he got saved Sunday night. Thank God he got saved Sunday night. That man was saved on Sunday and died on Monday. And he did not know he would die. He was a very healthy, you remember him. He was a very healthy, outgoing, excitable kind of man. Young, young man in his 20s. And he was gone just like that. So this life, yeah, it matters. But the real matter, the real important thing is, are you ready for the next? Well, you say you are, but let's, let's think about it. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. So what I want to talk to you about tonight is the high cost, the high cost of a free gift. 
the high cost of a free gift. I'm glad to see Dennis Shearer here. He's a preacher. And I'm glad to see dear Katie. She's a preacher. Susa. And so some of you preachers, you're probably scattered left and right over here. And I'm going to ask you preachers, you too, dear Dennis, and you too, dear Katie and others, and Suzanne, when you also minister, darling, you know, remind people, and maybe of you, many of you are probably watching on social media, remind people that this life is only a test. It's only a passing moment. So nice to, to see Keith Wheeler down here. Carried you across all over the world, brother. You know who Keith Wheeler is, guys? Stand up. Keith, stand up. This guy, this young man, has carried his cross in Iran. They, he, they, they almost killed him in some of those countries. Yeah. What are you doing here tonight? You just wanted to come? Michael sent me a text that you, you are here. Thank God, man. Okay. Anyways, and now he knows, he knows what I'm talking about because that's why we're here, all of us. I mean, why are we in this life anyways? To tell people, get ready for the Lord's coming. And when you stand before him, will you see a smile or not? Will Jesus smile or not? When, when, when people asked me, one young man Sunday, uh, years ago said to me, he said, what are you looking for for a reward? I said, a smile. I just want to see him smile. And he did not know what to say to me. So this life we call the Christian life is a gift. Our salvation is a gift. Faith is a gift. Grace is a gift. Everything God gives us is a gift. But I want to talk to you about the high cost of that gift that most people don't want to think about or talk about. So let's look at Ephesians 2. I'm going to, I'm going to give you two, two beautiful scriptures you all know to show you the gift. What is this gift we have that we sometimes ignore and don't think about. So it says in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So salvation, faith, grace is the gift of God. We don't pay for it, it's his gift. So this verse says, by grace are you saved. So here we see grace and salvation. Through faith, and here we see faith, that not of yourselves. You didn't do anything to get it. It's the gift of God. Not of works. You don't have to work for it. Lest any man should boast. And then I love the scripture in in Romans chapter 6 <clears throat> and verse 23, which you all know, but it's good to look at it again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What a gift that is. The gift of God is life eternal in his presence, in his presence. There are millions, hundreds of millions in hell right now who don't have that. And there's no way they can get it. Hell is a real place. I don't want you going there. I've seen hell. I've seen hell. I had a vision back in the 70s of hell. I saw people in a lake of fire when the Lord spoke and said, preach the gospel. But I don't rely on my vision to believe in hell. The Bible says it's there. The Bible, that's all we have is the Bible, not our visions and dreams. We don't go by our visions and dreams. We go by the Bible. 
If I never had a vision, I would still believe the Bible. The Bible is it. We have nowhere to go but the Bible. And the Bible is clear. Hell is a real place. And once you're there, there is no escape. There is no second chance. There is no repentance. Those tears would mean nothing to God. Nothing. It's in this, it's in this life we repent. It's in this life we make the change. And repentance has nothing to do with my past. It's more than my past. It's my life, it's my future, it's my destiny to live in repentance. Repentance is a life experience for the rest of my life. Not, not about my past. People think, well, I prayed a prayer, I'm in. Oh no, you're not in. It's discipleship the Lord asks for. Discipleship. It's eternal. Just someone, because they pray, it doesn't mean they're going to stay in the kingdom. Discipleship. So yes, of course, we repent and God forgives our sins in the past. But if, if we don't make a commitment, it means nothing. Means nothing. So we have this amazing, amazing gift called eternal life. Think about, just think about that one for just a few minutes. Eternal life in the presence of God. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. Jesus took our sin our death, and he went into the underworld and he brought out of paradise the saints of the Old Testament. He destroyed death and hell to set us free and we dare not accept him and live for him. So it's a free gift, of course, but it's a price. It's a very high price. So, we see grace and faith, salvation, free. Life eternal, free. So much more is free. And the Bible has a lot to say about this. So, you know, they say that the best things in life are free. Well, yeah, life is free. Life is free. You didn't pay to be born into this world. It's free. Everything that God gave us and gives us is free. Think about all the beauty around us, free. Everything that is on earth is freely given to humanity, freely given. It's men who make business out of it. God gave it freely, freely. You walk into a a store today, you see all the fruits and the vegetables that God gave us free. All the food is free. But men have made a big, big business out of it. They're not the ones who created those vegetables or anything else. It's God. God gave it to us. All right, now, but let's talk about what we have as gifts, free gifts, besides grace faith, salvation, life eternal. What else? Well, let's look at the book of Romans again, okay? Let's look at this beautiful portion in Romans chapter 5, verse 15 through 18. Look, look at this beauty here. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Here's another wonderful gift. For if through the offense of one, meaning Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded, meaning overflow, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, meaning Adam, so is the gift. 
For the judgment was by one, Adam, to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, talking about Adam, much more they, us, which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 18, as by the offense of one, meaning Adam, judgment came upon all men because he sinned, now all men are condemned and judged. So judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification. What an amazing portion of scripture. That this basically says, if I can paraphrase, Adam sinned and brought condemnation to the whole world. By his sin, all die. By his sin, sickness comes. Because of his sin, all the pain and misery of life came because of that one sin. One man sinning against God brought death and destruction to humanity. Now the Lord comes to earth and by his righteousness, he brings life back to humanity. He brings health to humanity. So what Paul is really saying is, one man, Adam, brings condemnation to the whole world, and now the whole world is living in sin, but one man, Jesus, takes the sin of the whole world upon himself and gives us life freely. Righteousness freely. I don't deserve to be righteous. I have done, I have done nothing to be righteous. But I have his righteousness. So do you. Think about it. Do you know that when we stand before God, he will look at you and me as though we accomplished what Jesus accomplished? Yeah, wow, well, I was right. We, we did not accomplish it at all. He accomplished it for us and gave his accomplishments to us as though we are the ones who did perfect, uh, all the things that he, he did in such perfection. So, no, it's his righteousness that we have. It's his life that we have. It's his grace and mercy on our life. So this is all free. Every bit of it is free. So here Paul the Apostle speaks of justification and righteousness and life. Free. It's a free gift. Think about this. Because I really want you to get this. Life eternal. Life eternal. People today want to live long and they do all kinds of things physically to live longer. But it means nothing. It just extends the pain. It just, it just means longer trouble, longer pain, longer sorrow, all that. No, no, forget that. Forget that. Jesus gave us life eternal, eternal, freely. That's amazing. Do you know how many millions, if not hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in hell now wish you had, that they had your chance to be sitting here alive and to be able to make that decision? Think, think about how many millions in hell would, would wish to switch places with you right now and sit here in this church and say, a second chance. There's no second chance. So I'm going to tell you all, don't mess it up. Don't blow it. 
No one will make hell by accident. No one will blame God when they're in hell. It's your choice, not his. And no one is going to make heaven by accident. It's our choice. Life is a choice. So you choose. You choose life or death. It's your choice. And you can't blame God when you're burning. And you will burn. You say, I, I, I don't like this, this message. I don't care what you like. I am not the pastor here. I don't have to look at you every Sunday. I come when they ask me to come. And when they don't ask me to come, I just don't come. And every so often they say, Dad, would you mind? Fine. So I'm I'm saying this to you because I'm 70 years old almost and I've learned heavy lessons about life. So let's not blow it. I don't care how rich you are, how famous you are, how whatever you are, it means nothing to God. It's how righteous you are that matters to God. I was, I was listening, I was listening on the way here. There's a wonderful thing today that you can all probably listen to on how the early church lived. What did they do to be separated from the world? Five things. The early church before Constantine, before Constantine, did not desire material wealth. That's a fact of history. These are written documents by Tertullian and other Christian historians of the day. This is about in the first century of the church. Nobody wanted material, material wealth in the early church. Number two, they did not want the entertainment of that day. Nobody went to parties, concerts, because they were pagan, pagan. Number three, no one was involved in politics. Boy, we need that now, don't we, huh? <laughs> no one was involved in politics in the first century. Number four, they believed in purity, total purity. Number five, their clothing, they made sure their clothing was different. Not in that they wore different clothing, they just were very modest in their dress, in their appearance. Now that was the early church. We need that today. Now, when you, when you, when you read the word, and I know some people don't really like hearing this, I don't care. Because I'm going to give you the Bible. I'm, I'm going to just give you the Bible. Is that a deal? Yes. Fine. Now, the word is very clear. Uh, life eternal is free. And it must be received free. In other words, that's the way you receive it. You can't pay for life eternal. You just receive There are countless, probably maybe millions of Christians today who still believe in works, that they're going to attain life and heaven by doing something, by working for it. The flesh always wants to work for it. No, God will reject your works because it's all done already. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. He did not say, he did not say to be continued by you. He said, it is finished. It is finished. I, I had a man on staff named Kiwi. Josh remembers Kiwi and Suzanne and 
Jesse remembers Kiwi. He was a big Samoan uh, gentleman from Samoa, and he was a Mormon. He was the head of my security in those days. One day I said, hey, Kiwi, you're a Mormon, huh? He said, yeah. I said, Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. He did not say to be continued by Joseph Smith. And he just stared at me. He said, say that again. I said, Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say to be continued by Joseph Smith. He said, I want to be saved. He got saved on the spot, that guy. Because he just realized it's finished. It is done. Aren't you glad Christianity is, you know, isn't about do, 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 do? It's, it's about done, 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 done. We, we simply accept the done work of Calvary. That's so simple. So, you cannot bargain with God. Because these people who want to work for it are bargaining with God. Let's make a deal, Lord. I'll do this, this, this. Just get me to heaven. No, no. You can't bargain with God because if you try, you'll be deeply disappointed. The gift of God is not for sale. Life is not for sale. Grace is not for sale. Faith is not for sale. It's free. Do you remember in Acts 8 when Simon the sorcerer thought he could buy the anointing and Peter rebuked him, said, not for sale. So, Salvation is God's gift to undeserving men, but now. Let's go to John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4, because I'm really coming uh, very slowly and, uh, you know, I'm kind of wanting you to get the message really good because some people sometimes don't listen to every word, you know. But let's just get this part here clear. In verse 10 of John 4, it says, Jesus answered and said unto, unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living waters. The last <clears throat> invitation in the Bible it says in Revelation 22, 17, let him come and freely drink of the waters of life. Isn't that precious? Yeah. Now let me say what I really want to say to you. Yes, salvation cost us nothing, but salvation costs God it cost him everything. It cost the father the sacrifice of his son. It cost the son his life. And it cost the Holy Spirit the age-long ministry of patiently wooing the stubborn hearts of sinful men. Think about the cost what God paid. We paid nothing. We paid nothing. The Father, it cost him the sacrifice of his own son. It cost Jesus his life. It cost the Holy Spirit this age-long, still going on, ministry of patiently drawing and wooing and bringing to himself the stubborn hearts of sinful humanity. So now when we receive, this is key, when we receive this free gift of salvation, when we receive life eternal, 
we have to know one thing. It took me many years to get to this amazing truth in my own life. Even though I heard it when, when I was young, I just didn't really understand it, you know. I didn't understand it. I used to listen to Miss Kuman, it's going to cost you your life. And I had no clue what she said. <laughs> you got to die. You got to die. She was so dramatic. You got to die. And I had no clue <laughs> what she meant by die. Boy, do I do, do I know that today? So, the minute we receive this free gift of salvation and faith and grace and mercy and life eternal and so much more, now we begin to understand, maybe not right away, you know, but we begin to understand the cost. And the cost is you have to renounce. You have to forsake self. We, we, we have to say no to the things that can destroy our destiny in God. And this is where... Um, Let's go to Philippians 3. This is where God wants to bring every one of us to the place that Paul came to. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read nearly the whole chapter, and I want you to get this, get this, like really get it. He says, finally, in other words, pay attention. This is an important word. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He said, to write the same things to you, to me, is not something grievous and not uh, something difficult or tedious, but for you it's safe. In other words, what I have to say is for your spiritual and eternal safety. So I just simply want to read what he says. This is his message, not mine. I'm just going to repeat his message. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision, meaning those who want to bring you back into legalistic Judaism. Because in his day, many were coming to the church saying, you have to obey Moses. You have to be circumcised. You have to obey the law. And he says, be careful of those who want to bring you back into bondage. So message number one, don't get back in the bondage that you came out of. Don't let anyone bring you back into bondage. No matter what it is. Legalism, bondage. You have to do what I tell you, bondage. See, all this is bondage. It's, it's called control, witchcraft. Don't let anyone try to control your life. You are a free man in Christ Jesus. And they were trying, the Judaizers of the day, people who were very devout Jews who had just gotten saved into the kingdom, but they were keeping the old laws and the old traditions of Judaism. And they were coming to the believers and saying, no, no, you have to do A, B, C, D, F, G to be saved. They were trying to bring them back into works. You, you gotta work for it, you gotta work for it. And Paul said, no, it's free. And then he says, we are the circumcision. We are in our hearts, which worship God in the spirit. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have no confidence in the flesh to do this and do this and do that. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, meaning let me talk to you about my past and my, my history and my life. He says, if any other man think that he has whereof he might trust the flesh, I more because... I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the stock of Israel, 
I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, I was a Pharisee. He is giving his credentials in the flesh. All that he accomplished in the flesh. You get this? Are you, are you all listening? So he was saying, if anyone can glory, I can glory about who I was in the flesh. I'm a Jew, a real Jew. I am from Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. When it came to the law, I was perfect. Concerning zeal, verse 6, concerning zeal, he was so zealous as a Jew, he said, I persecuted the church. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. All my education, all my upbringing, my history, my tradition, everything means nothing to me. Yea, doubtless, verse 8, and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dunk, that I may win Christ. All my education and accomplishments and all my medals and all my this and this that I did means dunk, that I may win the Lord. That I might win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith and what was he after that I may know him not know me in my past I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained. He said, I'm not there yet. Imagine Paul saying that. That's very comforting to me. And you. Because we're not there yet. After 50 years, I'm still not there. I, it would be 50 years next February for me to be in the faith. And I'm going to get there before I'm dead. I know it like I know it like I know it because I'm going to really, really do it. You say, how do you know? It's something I want in my life more than life itself. You say, why? Uh-huh. That's between Jesus and I. I'm going to get that smile. And I want you to become so stirred up about this that you will forsake things that you've never been able to forsake before. Let me hear a big amen. amen. Now, now, wait, wait. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Brethren, verse 13. No, let me go back to verse 12. I love verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after. Meaning, I am going to continue this pursuit. If that, watch, I love this. If that I may apprehend, or capture is the word, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Stop right there and look at me. He wrote those words in prison in Rome. He was chained to a pole. He was apprehended by chains. I've been there. I took my son with me one time. We took a picture right by that big round cement pole, whatever it was, some rock. And right there, Paul the apostle was chained for his faith. And he said, I want to capture Jesus like this chain has captured me. Wow. I want to apprehend what I'm apprehended for. I want Jesus to capture me like this big, big stone and these chains have captured me. Wow. 
Brethren, verse 13, I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm not there yet. But this one thing I do, I'm going to forget the past. Forget those things that are behind me. I'm going to reach forth unto those things before me. And I'm going to press with all my heart and all my might toward the mark. The mark. The goal for the prize of the high calling. That word high means upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to capture Jesus. He is my prize. He is that high calling of God. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. He wants us all to think the same way he does. And if, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, in other words, if you're not thinking about this, one day God will make you think about it. God shall reveal even this unto you. So I'm talking to a lot of people today here and around the world who never thought about this. I believe God is using me to let you think about it. Nevertheless, where to? Where to means to the, to the degree that we have already attained. Look at where you are, in other words. Let's walk by the same rule. Let's not forsake our commitment that we began with at salvation. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me. In other words, do what I've done. Follow my footsteps. Give up the world and all that is in it for the prize. And mark them which walk as you have us for an example. And the word mark them means note, take a note of how they live. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. They live to eat. Their belly is their God, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They're not minding heaven. They're not heavenly minded. They're earthly minded. He calls them enemies of the cross. For our conversation is in heaven. Our life citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What a day that will be. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That glorious miracle will happen at the rapture of the church. When your vile body will be transformed in twinkling of an eye and be like his. The dead in Christ will rise and we will meet them in the air and be transformed into his likeness in a second, much quicker than a second, by the way. Now the Lord, how many of you want this? What, what I just read? Okay, there's a price. We're still talking about the price. And I'm gonna explain the price to you. In Luke 14, verse 25, the Lord says, now here is the cost. We begin with this. Here is the cost of discipleship. What's the cost of me making it? Being accepted in his sight. If any man come to me, verse 26. Well, let's go from verse 20, 25 and down on. And there went great multitudes with him. He turned and said to them. 
Now you see, those people came for a miracle. They were there to receive healing physically. He said, if any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever does not bear his cross, meaning die to the flesh and to the world, and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's impossible to live the Christian life and live for the world at the same time. They just don't mix. Whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot. Impossible for them to be my disciples. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counts the cost? whether he has sufficient to finish it, whether he is able to finish it. Lest happily, after he had laid the foundation, isn't able to finish it, and all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, well, this man began to build, but wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults whether he's able with 10,000 to meet and defeat the man who comes against him with 20? Verse 33, so likewise, whosoever he be of you, I'm talking to you here tonight, all of you and around the world. Jesus is talking to all of us. He says, likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Discipleship. In this day of easy dis discipleship, people ignore this message. The Lord said, count the cost. Be sure you intend to finish well. Make a decision. I am not going to blow it all up. There's much to lose. And I want to say something to you, please. Do you know how bad those millions in hell wish they could pay the price that we have been asked to pay? They're paying a very heavy price right now. Those in that place called hell are paying such a heavy price. You don't even want to think about that one. You don't even want to think about that one. Gnashing of teeth. Such fear. Such torment. Eternally. That's a price. Nobody wants to pay that price. And all we are asked to do. Don't live for the world. But what does that really mean in today's mentality? What does it mean to us now, 2021? Yeah, we knew that back then in the first century, how they lived, nobody wanted money. Today, that's all you, 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 you talk about. We, God knows, we know we needed to pay our bills, of course. But what's really important? What's really important? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open my heart to you. There was a time I didn't think like this. There was a time I did not think like this. I am now. Because I truly want to be a real disciple. That's my prayer. And I will finish well. Whether you pray for me or not, I really don't care. Because it's me. I, you won't answer for me, and I can't answer for you on that day. I can't stand and say, oh, Lord, be paid. No, no. Each man will be there on his own. No lawyers allowed. No defense. If you really care for your soul, listen to what I'm telling you. 
Your mommy can't help you. Your dad cannot help you. Your friends cannot help you. And that seat will be a judgment seat, not a seat of love and grace and mercy. We will stand before the judgment seat for our work. And we don't want to talk about the great white throne judgment now because we as believers, if we don't do what God says, we will be rejected. We will be cast out. That's Bible, completely in the Bible. Remember, the way to heaven is narrow. Narrow. And he said, many there will be that will not find it. But the way to destruction, very wide. And many will find it. Yeah, I'm glad I'm scaring you. That's good for your soul. Because you'll remember that one. It says, save some as by fire. So we have to remind ourselves. You know, Peter said, make your election sure. Seeing those things, make it sure. Your soul is worth way more than your house or your job or your fame or your gifts or whatever. That's all you have is your soul. What if you gain the whole world, the Lord said, and lose your soul? It means nothing. It means nothing. You cannot take your money with you. You cannot take your accomplishments with you. Hell doesn't care about your position and money. The devils don't care. All you can take what I've done for Christ will last. What I've done for myself and others means nothing. Only what I've done for Jesus matters. So we have to live our life completely, daily, 24 hours a day for the Lord and say no to the world daily because that world wants us back every day. We have these devils coming saying, come on back, come on back. No. And we say no, never. And it's a daily fight. That's why I'm talking to you. It's a daily war. So, if you don't forsake all, you cannot be my disciples. Now, let me get back a little bit because I kind of need to explain this to these sweet young people sitting listening here. Because when you talk about the early church, yeah, we can understand that we older people, you know, I grew up in a very innocent kind of life. Uh, my mom, my dad brought us up uh, fearing my daddy, you know. We were very disciplined kids in the house. I went to a, a, a school by Catholic monks and before them the, the nuns and they were tough on us. We were not allowed to do anything. The boys had their own school and the girls had their own school. There was no mixture back then of boys and girls together. So no hanky-panky allowed. <laughs> and when we grew up, it's the same. There were no girls in my class. Only like, like me, just young people. We grew up in a very innocent world. There was no internet. None of the stuff today. But the price has not changed. It hasn't changed. The Lord said, you have got to stay away from the world. And there's a big disagreement today in America on what that means. They hated them then for the way they lived. When someone got saved, they stopped looking for fame and money and fortune. When they got saved, they stopped going to the theaters and the entertainment and the gladiator shows, whatever, because people were getting killed. When they got saved, they, they even stopped going to uh, things like uh, sports because in those days, the sports were very paganistic. They, they, they talked about pagan gods and all that. So they... they, they Stop doing that. So they had to pull away from their, from their world. And they hated them for it. 
Today they hate us because we're too involved in the world. Especially in this country. They hate the church because we're involved in politics. We're too involved in things that we should not be involved with anyways. It's not a very popular message when I say that. People get upset with me. I don't care. God never called us to be involved in politics. We're, we're, we're to pray for those in authority, even if we don't like them. Think about Nero. Nero, wicked Nero, who killed Christians, who burnt them and stuck them on poles to light up his parties. Would you pray for him? They prayed for him, yeah. Because Paul said, pray for those in authority. Not one Christian ever went and fought Nero or opposed his authority. They prayed for him while he was killing them, burning their bodies for his own parties. He said, well, I don't know that. Go and find out for yourself. It's all there for you, the history of the church. So in today's world, you make up your mind. What does that mean to you? I know what it means to me. There are a lot of things I don't really care to be a part of. I, I don't enjoy at all, at all. When my boy was 14, he wanted to go to the Lakers game. And I went just for him. I hated it. Jessica was sitting next to me. I said, what are these people running around for down here? <laughs> she said, Dad, be serious. I said, honey, I don't even know what they're doing. She said, you really are clueless. I just wasn't brought up in it. That boxer, you know, Manny from the Philippines, whatever his last name is, I can't. Yeah, yeah. Manny, that's his name. He had someone call me last week. He said, uh, I'm going to fight my last fight in Las Vegas on the 21st of August. Please come pray for me. And he wanted me to come to the, to the fight. Uh-uh. <laughs> I will be tormented looking at those heathens. That's not my crowd. I don't want to go through what I went through when I took Joshua. There was a drunk guy in front of me. I was sitting on the se second row, third row, and a drunk guy with his beer, he went, hey, look at this. It's the preacher, Benny Hinn here. And I thought, oh dear God, I'm getting out, I'm getting out. And my children had me sit there. And I'm still mad at you for letting me sit there. <laughs> but I did it for Josh because I love my baby. I want nothing to do with this madness. Maybe you like it. Ah, enjoy it. But make a decision. You have to still make a decision. Is it edifying your Christian life? Is it adding to your walk with God? Is it that important in these last days while our time is so short to play games with your destiny? To waste time with things that don't matter about your spiritual life? I want to make you real jealous. I was sitting this morning reading my Bible and I was having communion. I thought I was in heaven. I thought I was in heaven. When I took that bread to partake of the bread, I can tell you the fact before God, had the Lord been standing there next to me physically, it would have made no difference. He was there so close, I could feel his body around me. Joy? You talk about joy? Peace? I've never done drugs. I never want to do drugs. I don't know what it feels like to do drugs. But there's nothing that can compare with what I felt this morning. 
Nothing that can compare. The joy, the peace, the glory cannot be given by any pill or any whatever they, that crazy stuff people do. It's just beyond words. And sometimes I think, dear God, let me die right now. I, I, I don't want to come back. It's glory beyond words. Peace that passeth all understanding. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. It happened this morning. I love it. I love it so much. I love it so much. I don't ever want to lose it. I want you to love Jesus so much. I want you to love him so deeply and dearly and loyally and faithfully that when people see you, they'll say, I want to be just like that guy. Or like that young lady. I'm almost done, so don't walk out on me. I think this is important. So, the Lord in Matthew 21, let's go to Matthew 21 quickly, in verse 44. Casting ourselves on him. We can't do it on our own. Come on, I can't even do that on my own. There's nothing that's, that's in me that, that I even trust. I don't trust my heart. No, and you can't trust your heart. We have no strength to surrender. It's his work in your life. If you let him do it. Matthew 21, 44. So precious is this verse. Whosoever shall fall on the stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What God wants is this. Look at me, all of you. He said, come unto me, all you who labor. That's in Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And take my yoke on you, because my yoke is easy. Take my burden, because it's very light to carry it. You have a very heavy burden. You have a very heavy yoke. It's called sin. Every person in this room and watching has a big load on you called sin. That's so easily wraps itself around your neck every day. That so easily besets us, it says. And the Lord says, give me that load. Come unto me, not to the preacher, not to the church, to me. In other words, you need to be in my presence. You need to know me for you to do that. Anyone who does not have that intimate relationship with the Lord cannot give him the burden. He doesn't know what to do with the burden. But once you seek him, you'll find him. And trust me, seeking Jesus is the most wonderful and easiest thing in the world. You just sit there and do nothing. <laughs> Think about that. You don't have to pound the floor and beg and cut your body like they do in some religions. And go crazy running around like they did with the prophets of Baal. You just sit there on a beautiful little chair, whatever you want. Rocking chair. God accepts rocking chairs. <laughs> Open your Bible. Put some beautiful worship music and just read and wait. And eventually he's going to show up. And when he shows up, the tears will flow. And the peace will come. And the joy will come. And then say, I give you my burden. And he'll take it. And so he said in Matthew 21, 44, he said, if you fall on the stone, on the rock, meaning me, you have to break. Brokenness is the way it happens. Repentance. That's what brokenness is. The problem with the church today, nobody teaches repentance and brokenness. David said, Lord, you don't desire sacrifice. 
A broken heart is what you desire. You'll never reject a broken heart. A contrite heart, you'll never despise. And when you sit on that chair, rocking or whatever, and you wait on the Lord quietly, beautifully, patiently, look, when I go to the eye doctor, I have to sit there and wait sometimes a whole 45 minutes for him to call me in so he can check my eyes. And I have to look at miserable looking people who look so sad <laughs> and so depressed. And I have to walk and I sit in my car. I've, I've actually had to sit, I said, I'm gonna sit in my car till they call me, I can't just sit here. <laughs> it's too depressing looking at these people. <laughs> I might as well sit in my car by myself. They're just me. I said, now you Chad, you tell me when they're ready and I'll go in, I don't wanna go be in there. I've had to wait for doctors, for dentists, for whatever, for a long time. It takes them much longer than Jesus to show up. <laughs> and I still have to wait for them so he can tell me it's okay with your glaucoma. Whatever. They, they told me I have the, the early stages of, because of the pressure, but he said, oh, you'll, you'll have your, your sight for a long time. You just need to take some drops. I said, thank you very, very much. A nice, he's a nice doctor from Puerto Rico. God bless him. But I, I, I've waited for him much longer than I wait for the Lord. Much longer! It's so nice when I sit in the morning and I just wait. Ooh, my. Nobody to look at. And he shows up like he did this morning and I, I feel like I'm going to float with joy and that's why I give him my children my burdens I pray for Sue every morning and for Jessica and Michael and this church I pray for you pray for all of you say Lord it, they're, they're yours in your hands and I feel like I'm about to just fly to glory when I'm talking to him because I talked to him at the end not in the beginning I wait in the beginning. And then I take communion. Ooh, and then I talk to him about you. He comes first. You come second. <laughs> but the thing is, you cannot give God your burdens if you rush in. No. And that's when brokenness happens. But listen to this. It says, whoever falls on the stone will be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder the alternative is fearful or we fall upon him and be broken or he will fall upon us forever and crush us with judgment repentance he said go and tell them to repent Bruce just swill stuff behind me and repentance is not please listen to this one I beg you it's concerned not merely with the sorrow for the past but with our intentions for the future It is, it is the abandoning of our selfish ways to God's ways. A lot of people say, well, just accept Jesus and be saved. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches full surrender. Not just accept Jesus and you're in. Full surrender to his lordship to his yoke on you. He said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. What's his yoke? I'm talking about it. Give up the world. Stop living for yourself. Live for him. That's his yoke. And, and he said, that yoke is very easy. 
very light. Just give it up. And turn your eyes. Just play it for me. So there can be really no receiving Jesus. You, you can't receive him unless there is a full commitment, full commitment of your life. Yeah. Salvation has cost you nothing and will cost you everything. I repeat, salvation has cost you nothing, but it will cost you everything. I want to read just one more scripture from 1 John chapter 2. Pick up the key there, Bruce, behind me. He that saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So you can't say, I know Jesus, and you're not obeying what he says. When, when, when he says, give me your, your yoke, and I'll give you mine. Take, take my yoke. If you, if you don't want his yoke, you're not a, a, a real Christian. Yeah, it's, it's going to cost you. Submission to the Lordship of Jesus is not an option. a must yeah it will cost you to follow him and I've made that choice so have many of you the cross is the emblem of our faith the gift of salvation free but it's going to cost you your life total surrender to the Lord no more fighting. No more trying to live. I'm going to get a little personal with you, if you allow me. My mom and my dad wanted me to go to Seneca College when I was young. My dad sat me in the car and offered me the world. They weren't saved in those days. Our family, to this day, are very rich people. My cousins are millionaires. They're in the trade business. They buy and they sell. They go looking for bankruptcies and they buy it and they sell it. They all have very expensive cars, very big expensive homes. They live in Canada, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And my daddy wanted us to be business people, be in business, you know, make money. So I got saved and I said, Lord, I want to serve you. So I went to my dad one day, I said, I'm going to be a preacher. And he got very, very angry. He said, if you ever become a preacher, we will forsake you. We will cut you out. And he meant it. In our culture, it happens all the time. They just cut you. You're just gone. They don't, they don't even look at you. For three years, my dad would not, would not even look at me. He, he didn't even acknowledge my existence at the house. So one day he took me for a, for a car ride and was so sweet and wanted to offer me whatever I wanted. I said, Father, I will obey you in everything except this. I will not walk away from Jesus. And he went into a rage. I mean, a rage. His language changed. His whole face changed. And I knew if you preach, it's over. It's over. But I made the decision, I will pay the price. If I lose my family, so be it. And that's what the Lord meant in Luke. If you love your father, your mother more than me, you're not worthy. There are people sitting here today that may have to make that very painful choice. 
Is it mom and dad and what they want or is it what God wants? So I made that decision. Yeah, it was painful, very, very, very hard. My cousins made fun of me like you're crazy. They call me all kinds of names. Then I began to preach. My dad came with my mom. They discovered, they found it out from one ad in the paper. I never told my dad I would preach. I was too scared. You know, we're Middle Eastern people, a little different, wild. No, not much emotions, you know. So I look at, and I see my mom and my dad sitting in the back of this little Pentecostal church where I was preaching on Lakeshore. And I said to Jim Pointer sitting next, I said, my, my parents are here. He said, where? I said, that's them right there. My mom and my dad came to check things out. I was so scared, I, ugh, it was terrible. But I preached the gospel. They didn't move, they just stared the whole time. They did not lift their hands, close their eyes, didn't smile, just stared. And I thought, no good. <laughs> so I said to Jim, I said, Jim, let's, uh, let's wait till two in the morning and then go home. Because I knew this is it. This is bye-bye forever. I said, just in case, you just take me home and I'll go in quietly and get my stuff and we'll leave. And he said, you can come stay with me. I said, fine, thank you, with his wife and family. And I purposely wanted to go late so uh, I can sneak in quietly when they're sleeping and leave. And my mom and my dad are sitting waiting in the living room. And my father looks at me and says, son, how can we become like you? And they got, they got saved that night. Because my father looked at my mom and said, that's not your son up there. Your son can't do this. He can't talk like that. He said, his God must be real. And then the whole family was changed and transformed. It was glorious. And then, you know, the years went on and I went back to Canada and had a big crusade at the Maple Leaf Gardens and those, those cousins showed up, those rich cousins. One of them named Eddie, he said, you know, he said, we used to call you an idiot. You were the crazy fool. He said, it looks like you're not the fool, we are. He said, you found what you're looking for. I said, I found who I was looking for not what I was looking for. And he looks at me and, and, and he says, how can we become like you? I said, well, you gotta go find the Lord for yourself. When my father, when my father passed away, my mom had the service at the Greek Orthodox Church and all of them showed up. All my cousins and all my aunts and all my uncles and the church was packed. 700 seats were jammed. And my mom said, you're preaching. So she told the priest who looked like Abraham Lincoln with crosses. <laughs> she said, my son will preach. We don't want you to preach. He said, this is my church. She said, we, we are paying you. This is our service. You go sit down. <laughs> she was tough like nails. My mom was tough. The priest was so mad. He said, this is my church. She said, we're paying you. So go sit down. She said, my son Benny will preach the service. And they were all crying. They were all sad. It was so funny to watch. You got to stop playing for this because it's nothing spiritual about it whatsoever. <laughs> so I, I, I said, I got to wake them up. I have got to wake these people up. They were all slumbering and crying and, woo, you know, and wearing, you know, all the women were wearing the, the, the scarves and no makeup and they looked horrible, all of them. And, and they're crying, they're crying. And all the men looked, you know, they, they, they didn't shave. That's the way they are, they don't shave. So they, they even look more, mis more miserable. And everybody looked like he was mourning and whatever. So I said, this is it, I'm gonna go fix them all up. So I went and I took the, <laughs> the casket was on this, these things with little wheels and I shook it. 
the priest, the priest was sleeping. He was sitting asleep. And I said, I'm going to fix that boy up too. So I came down and I, I shook and I pounded. I said, pow, my daddy is not in the box. And they all woke up. That priest, he came alive. He said, oh my God. He thought I was going crazy. I said, my daddy got saved. He's not in the box. Pow. And I preached the gospel to them. I had to wake them up. I had to wake them up. And the only way I could wake them up, the only way I could wake them up is by pounding that casket and shaking it. It almost fell off, by the way. And then I called my family up. Suzanne was there. She, she remembers that day very, very well. And I called Sue up and I called Roy and Tommy Reed was there and the family and we all stood and sang. Then sings my soul a cappella, no music. My, we began singing how great thou, thou, thou art and, and I had to open one eye. I thought I've got to look to see what's going on out there. We had our eyes closed. I said, no, I can't keep my eyes closed. I've got to look right now. And I'm looking at them and they're all staring at me like not a soul moved like they were just staring and all of us with hands uplifted the whole family and my dear some some of my cousins came up they said what have you got what what, what is this I said it's called the anointing <laughs> and one guy said I want that but you know what is so sad they could not give up their money they were too rich to give up their money and when I told them that to be a Christian means you forsake it all, they couldn't do it because too much mullah, too much money to lose. So only those who are really called, who are really predestined, can come to Jesus. The Lord said, no man can come unto me unless the Father draws him. So tonight, you have to make a decision. And some of you may have to make a decision again because of the way you're living. It's not a Christian life you're living. It's a carnal life. Just because you prayed one day and now you're still living for the world, that's not Christianity. Time is running out. Time is really running out. Not much time left on earth for you or me. It's not worth running after fame. I've been in this 50 years. 50 years. It'll be 50 years next February. I've seen them come. I've seen them go. I've seen young people, very famous, destroyed. Destroyed. Ruined. Because they sought worldly recognition in the catacombs in Canada some of those people were amazing singers with amazing voices some of them went into the world went into the world some of them went back on drugs they could not stay away from the demons they had destroyed many of them died early young they overdosed after getting saved I don't want that to happen to you. Yeah, it's a price. Would you please bow your heads? I need thee, oh, I need thee. If you want to make that commitment tonight to please your master, your redeemer, not your family, not your mom, your dad, not your friends who want you to make it in life, means nothing if you want to please the Lord and s surrender to the Lord and give your life to the Lord and truly surrender even your future I want you to, to get up out of your seat and start walking here slowly and get on your knees in front of this altar if you really want to surrender if your life is not what it should be, you come and you kneel right here. And he will see you here. 
and he will hear your heart's cry. And he will change your heart, I promise you. What you cannot do, he will do for you. He will subdue your sins for you, the Bible says in Amos. He will throw your sins behind his back. He will give you the will and the doing to live holy. You cannot trust your own hearts. You only trust the Lord. Only the Lord. And some of you need to give the Lord all the things you accomplished. Just like Paul said, I count all but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. No more seeking the things that the world wants you to do or your family wants you to do. Yeah, I was on my way to Seneca College and on that bus stop, God said, go home. He said, go home. I turned around and I went home. My mom said, so soon early? I said, I'm not going. It was a week later, I went to a Catherine Kuhlman service and my life was changed. Where would I be today if I went on that bus? What if I went to that college to learn travel? I would be nowhere, maybe dead. But here I am, 50 years later, still here, happier than ever. You have a choice to make. And he's waiting for your decision. There are a lot of people at this altar. And some of you in your homes need to make that same decision. Can you all stand and pray in the Holy Spirit right now for these precious people? At the, at, the, at the altar. Just lift your, your, your hands and your voices and just pray in the spirit of mine. Come on, all of you. Be still and know I am God. Lift your voices and pray in the spirit. Come on, saints. Pray in the spirit, all of you. I'm going to ask some of the students from the school to please come and just pray with them. Lay hands on them. Come on. All the students from the school, if you're here tonight, come and just lay hands on some of these sweet people and pray with them. Agree with them. Talk to them. If you are a student at the school, you come and just pray with them. They need support right now they, they need someone to pray with them can I ask you to do something can I ask you to uh, look at each other just turn around and look at the person there with you that who's praying for you and let's just talk to them right now ask them what is it they want what are they praying for and agree with them right now. Just talk to them. Come on. I want all the students to start talking to those people on their knees. What is it they are asking God for? What are they asking God for? And then pray with them. Pray with them. And before you leave, don't leave till I tell you. Before you leave, stretch your hands towards them. Come on. Lord, we commit these wonderful souls to you. We commit their hearts to you. Bless them, I pray. Magnify yourself through their life in Jesus' holy name for your glory. Can we all pray this one prayer, all of you here on your knees and everyone else, lift your hands and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Spirit, soul, body, it's yours. Wonderful Lord. Right now, wash me, cleanse me with your blood. 
I surrender totally, completely to you, to your will, wonderful Jesus. I do not want to lose your favor. I do not want to lose you. I want to finish well, to please you, to be faithful, to be loyal unto the end. Let my love be real. Give me that love. Baptize me with your love that I would love you with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. Wonderful Lord, use me in these last days and on that glorious day as I stand before you I want to see your smile. I want to please you, not only in this life, but forever. Amen. Now go ahead and pray with them, all of them, these precious people right here. And I surrender all, everything in the instruments, please. And all to Jesus. I surrender, I surrender all, I surrender all, and I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Lift your hands, sing it again in faith. I Surrender all I I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior once again please with all your hearts and I surrender Savior as they keep praying for the people I just want to just say one thing before I give it to Jessica Jesse come stand next to me baby when does school start school when does school start beginning of September, beginning of September. there's a lot of people watching who need to come and be a part of the school. I have felt the last few days, baby, something mighty is coming to that school. No, I'm sensing it's strong for you. The Lord is gonna really bless these young people and fulfill the word he gave me at Jesus 19. You're gonna see the beginning of it in this, coming school so you get ready for it because the Lord is about to do something wonderful and you that are not a part of that school be a part take my word for it don't miss it you'll regret missing this coming uh, year because it could literally launch you into a new place with the Lord so I'm all done thanks for having me you're such a good girl I adore you and uh, it's all yours yeah, just, um, just thank you so much. I always thank you, but I'm so honored to have him and so thankful for your Great voice. Us, yeah. um, we love you. We will see you next Sunday morning and Sunday night. Um, if you need prayer for any reason, physical, emotionally, or anything, our prayer team is going to come line up maybe right here because um, I think there's still people at the altar and they would love to pray for you. We love you so much. Good night.
God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day to give you life and to prove that he is the Son of God who he said he was. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for those who belong to him, he is interceding for them eternally. And that same Jesus will return again. He will crack the eastern sky like a whip and with ten thousands upon ten thousands, he will return in glory. In 2017, we received a word from Lou Engle that we really believe is the word of the Lord for our school, our house, and the entire ministry. Lou said that the greatest musicians in the world, and the greatest vocalists in the world, the greatest worshipers, that they would descend upon Orlando, Florida to Jesus' image. And that word began to burn in us, and we began to dream about what it would look like to one day have a school where people would come to worship Jesus and be in his presence and receive his word. And a church was birthed in that same worshiping atmosphere. And what a beautiful opportunity that we have as a Jesus people to come before him and to be at his feet and to pour ourselves out before him. Worship has the potential to unlock things that really nothing else in the world can unlock. And so we decided about a year ago to launch a, an opportunity within the Jesus School setting for those worshipers, for the musicians, for the singers, for the dancers, for the artists, for the poets. And this is going to be a place where you can come and you can learn and you can grow. And we have highly trained instructors who are going to be coming they're going to be teaching instruments. They're going to be teaching vocals. Anything that you can think of with worship, it's going to be there. The worship is not about us. We worship for Him. So we want to invite you to come. Come worship the King of Kings with us. So come and be a part of what the Lord is doing. Come and give your heart to the Lord. Come and surrender yourself to the Lord. And let's be ones that are willing to rise and go. And we decided to name it after Bethany, that wonderful house where Jesus was ministered to, that place where the feelings of Jesus were preeminent. It was a place where he desired to not only move and work and teach and do wonderful things, but a place where he would be adored, a place where he would rest, a place where he would run to so that he would receive ministry. And so now Jesus School, has this space that's been created for all of you who are desiring to use your vocal gifts, your instrumental gifts, your gifts of worship, your dancing gifts, and give them to Jesus. That Jesus would make this a Bethany, that he'd make our lives a Bethany, where he'd come and rest and recline among us. You were created to experience the presence of God in a way that will transform your life, family, and the world. We understand how difficult it can be to find time to attend a school where you study the Word of God, grow in your faith, and build a community of believers. And that's why we created Jesus School Online. 
We believe that the Holy Spirit is unlimited in his reach. No matter where you live or what stage of life you're in, we invite you to take part in this amazing online opportunity. You'll be led by world-renowned speakers and worship leaders. You will be taught to seek Jesus daily, be activated in the power of the Holy Spirit, learn to share the gospel, and build community with Jesus' people from around the world. At Jesus School Online, we are passionate about seeing a Jesus people raised up to shake the nations for the glory of God. You were created for this moment in history. The Jesus people are emerging and we have one ambition. Jesus himself. Will you join us?